Hang on. Welcome everybody to Wildlife Wednesday. Great to have you here. We're very excited to have you with us. I see that we've got Valerie in our waiting room here and Anne as well. And we are gone live on Facebook on Calgary Migratory Species Response Team. And I know that Gavin will be sharing it further as well. I'm very happy to have you all here. So if you would like to, you can make some uh, comments or questions right on Facebook Live if you would like. Um, on the Calgary Migratory side is where I will see your questions. For those who are actually on the Zoom video right now, you can also comment right on the, uh, right on the chat within Zoom as well. All right. Perfect. So just one moment. I'm just going to mute for one moment or I'll check a couple of things here. All right. So Gavin, are you able to hear me okay? And Gavin is actually just working in the background right now, sharing yeah, over I to can hear you. Couple of, hey, there you are. Hey, Gavin, how's it going? Good. Yeah, I'm. I'm doing good right now. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here today and present this. So, yeah, I think it'll be Perfect. That's fantastic. Well, originally these sessions started out as learning events just for our volunteers. We have a fantastic group of volunteers who, um, when we we're doing our, our monitoring downtown, they go out early in the morning or late at night during migration periods to watch for birds or bats that have been affected by window strikes or by lights or other structures or um, other risks that animals do find uh, in the urban environments. So uh, of course, we need volunteers in order to do all of this work and we have a great team so the um learning events were intended to share our learning uh within the group but due to covid we can't get together physically but the one side benefit is now we've gone uh a little bit more techy and we can actually share this further so gavin had offered to do this session for us uh uh, a couple of months ago, actually, so we're really excited to have him back. Um, we've changed the format a little bit. It was going to be going out and doing some owling. And uh, instead of that, today we're going to talk about the basics of birding and answering questions that you might have. Um, before we get uh, too far along, I first want to let you know and proudly happy to tell you we're hosting this session from the traditional ter territories of the Nitsitapi Blackfoot, the people of Treaty 7 uh, region in southern Alberta, which includes the Siksika, the Bikani, the Kainai, the Sutini, Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda. We're situated on land where the Bow River meets the Elbow River and the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the City of Calgary. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So Gavin, are you all set up over on your end there? Yeah, I'm, I'm all set up here. Perfect. I'm not sure if your video is on. We see your picture when you're speaking. I know yesterday when we chatted, you were all set up quite nicely in. Uh... Yeah, I just popped the video on now. There we go. There we are. Perfect. Great. Well, welcome to our volunteers and welcome to everybody out there. So, so I'm really happy to introduce Gavin McKinnon. He is uh, living in Calgary right now, but originally you came from Guelph, Ontario, I understand. Actually, yeah. what, where, where did you start out? You were born? Uh, I actually in... started out in Regina. And then Regina, that's right. Golf and then out here, yeah. Perfect. And then we all know Gavin really well. Um, he's just a tremendous uh, birder and a great teacher. And last year you had met a really important milestone in terms of birding. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so last year I uh, tried to do, a, I guess, kind of what you would call an Alberta big year. I uh, 
started off with kind of the goal of trying to see free hunted species in in the calendar year of 2019 and i managed to get there um i actually surpassed that by seven species so i got to a total of 307 which was really exciting for me oh fantastic good for you that's terrific that's great. Well, I'm not sure if any of our volunteers are online right now. You mentioned that if you had, anybody had some initial questions that uh, you'd be open to answering them. So I'm not sure. I'll just go to our Yeah, Zoom. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Does anybody on Zoom here have any initial questions? We're quiet in the crowd, so I will. You know what, why don't you, yeah, we've got a note there, none for now, but I know that there'll be, will be some that will come. Um, now you just were on a trip up in Northern Alberta. Oh, I do have a question for you here. What is yes. your favorite bird, Gavin? Oh, What's what is my bird? favorite bird? I, I feel like that, that changes every day. Um, I guess a good answer would be whatever bird I'm looking at um, at that time. Um, yeah, really, it, it depends on what mood I'm in, depends on where I am. So uh, I don't really have a set favorite bird. Oh, okay. Well, we'll accept that. We'll accept that. Do you have a top five? Um, I, I'd like to think <laughs> that my favorite groups are probably uh, warblers and shorebirds. Um, gulls are tricky. Um, admittedly, I'm not the best at gulls. Um, or any other, uh, I guess, family. But uh, I try, I try um, for sure. What about parrots? Um, I, yeah, <laughs> parrots are obviously cool. Um, I've seen, I've seen a few parrots down in South America and Central America. So those are, uh, yeah, those are, they're pretty, they're pretty awesome to see, especially in the larger flocks down there. Oh, that's excellent. I can't imagine what that would be like to see them all in the wild. Yeah, it's really yeah. cool. They're very, they're very noisy. Um, yeah, they, they wake you up. What was the hardest? Is that the hardest species defined uh, on my big gear? Um, yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. Yeah, one of our volunteers to... uh, in the chat is asking, "What is the hardest species to find?" Yeah, yeah I that's, saw a that. that's a question. tough one. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Oh. oh. <laughs> one that shouldn't have been tough that took it sandhill crane for me i didn't get them in spring migration so for the summer i think i took like four or five trips to try and find a sandhill crane before i eventually had one flying over our tent uh woke me up at about five in the morning um flying over uh and then i got them again in the fall um in the middle of the night i heard them but um that was a really tough one for me you know You'd think I would say something like uh, that just barely comes into the province, um, like maybe black swift or something, something along those lines. It's very localized, but I didn't really have much trouble with those. Um, yeah, but Sandhill Crane really was a tough one for me last year. Oh wow! Yeah, they and were then... they were calling. They have this really uh, bubbly call. Um, it's quite loud and. I know it was in Castle Provincial Park down in the southwest corner of the province. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I was going to actually ask you too, and I know you're going to touch on this on your um, on your presentation. Uh, we were talking yesterday, uh, of course, how we've come to do these sessions is that a lot of us are stuck at home, self-isolating, yeah. um, anywhere from really not able to leave home at all to just basically going to work and coming back. So a lot of home time right now, or, or even the places that we can go are fairly limited. So, yeah. so this seems to be an activity that people can do from, um, from basically from anywhere that they are. And I noticed there was a post earlier today on one of the birding sites by a gentleman who, who is actually handicapped and, and in a wheelchair. So not able to, um, to go out. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're here and able to share some insights on what we can do even out our window in terms of enjoying the wildlife that we see. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, if you have a bird feeder, um, you can try, you can attract many different species. Even though some you can set up hummingbird feeders, um, 
it's really good to plan. I'm just looking at my yard over here, figuring out what I could do better right now. Um, but yeah, planting native plants is a really big thing. Birds um, will be attracted to that. They're not super attracted to having lots of lawn. So if you can cut back on that and have more native plants in there, that's really going to help uh, having more birds in your yard. Uh, always having a water feature would definitely help as well. Okay, that's terrific. And I noticed also some uh, tips from Safe Wings Ottawa. We always are talking about keeping our, our the birds safe from our windows. And one thing that I hadn't thought of that I thought was really interesting is that they said that you either want to have your feeders a good distance away from your windows where they're not in direct line if something spooks them that they would fly into your glass or to have them very, very close, like within a half of a meter of your glass. Mm -hmm. So either about... I can't remember if it's 30 feet or 30 meters. I'll be about 30 feet away. Yeah, 30 meters. Or half a meter off. away. 30 meters to be pretty far. Yeah. yeah uh, for sure. Like they have feeders, there are feeders that you can actually stick onto your windows. Whoa. I just had a oh, hummingbird yeah, fly great. over me. Don't know what it was right over my head. Anyways. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and Cedar Wax Wings are back tonight. Um, so that's exciting. Um, the, yeah, but you have these uh, feeders that you can stick on your windows and with suction cups and the birds can come right to them and they all feed out of that feeder. And I've, I've just been uh, eating a snack and had uh, goldfinch come right up to the window and that's really cool. Uh, um, even when I started birding, I think we only had one feeder and that was the feeder we had right on the window. And I had so many birds get, you really got a great look at the birds um, too. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I actually have one. Um, I have to replace the suction cups on mine because I left yeah. it in a bad spot during the winter. But they're actually really sturdy, a lot sturdier than they seem. And uh, I would agree. We had some great birds when I had mine up. Yeah, so, they're... definitely. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, I heard it. I still going to want to have some more feeders. Uh, I have a peanut feeder, um, some suet. I want to get some mealworms too, see what uh, other kinds of birds, maybe some robins will come in. But um for sure, yeah, you can do a lot from your yard. Um, I've probably seen close to 100 species out of my yard here. I've lived here in this uh, house for about three years, so probably seen close to 100 species here. Oh, that's fantastic. And I know that oftentimes we have um, folks joining us from some of uh, the First Nations around Calgary. Have you done any work down in the south or in the west or any of the other areas? Because I bet you even, um, no matter where you are, Lots of different species on the yeah. prairie um, and close to the mountains yeah, too. Uh, on our Prudus Christmas bird count, um, we have an area in Sutina, um, and that's uh, that's one of the more productive areas. We had a northern pygmy owl in there last year. Uh, unfortunately for that count, I was going to cover one of the areas, but I wasn't feeling well, so I had to go home. But um, oh. I hope to be able to uh, bird in that area again um, for the Christmas bird count in Prudus. Um, oh, fantastic. But yeah, yeah, great birds. Uh, I kind of feel bad letting one person cover an area meant for two people that day, but I mean, they had a very good day, so. Wow, well, if anybody in those areas is interested in taking uh, part in the Christmas bird count, can they contact you or who would yeah, they? Yeah, 100%, have just, um, just email me, uh, gmckinnonbird at gmail.com. And yeah, we'll add you to a team and uh, you'll help us count birds for the day. Uh, I don't know what it's going to look like this year um, with physical distancing and the Christmas bird count. So that'll be interesting to see, but um, hopefully we'll be able to do it in some form or other. Right on. That sounds great. I see a, um, a question here. I hear hummingbirds all the time when I'm in my yeah. yard, but they don't seem to come to the feeder. Do you yeah. have any suggestions? Um, you, you're going to want to change your sugar water very regularly. Um, the, the, I, haven't had, I haven't had a hummingbird feeder, a successful hummingbird feeder in Calgary yet. Um, in Guelph, I used to have but a hummingbird every day, um, just, the ruby, just one ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, and we changed the sugar water in there about every three or four days. So you want to keep it fresh. Um, they would they do prefer native flowers though um over that like it would it would come into the flower my mom had a little flower garden and they would come in there way more than that would ever come to the feeder so oh wow 
Well, that's good. Yeah, because I guess the sugar water can hold them over until we have some native flowers that are growing. Yeah. And then they're on to that. It's always a good idea to keep your uh, hummingbird feeders out um, later too. Um, because in the in the late fall, you can get some rare, hum interesting hummingbirds, such as uh, Anna's hummingbird. Um, I saw an Anna's hummingbird last year uh, in the middle of October, um, and that was a new bird for my year down down in Beaver Mines again, actually. Um, oh wow! But they, if you keep your feeders out um, for a while after all the other hummingbirds left, you know, if you get something, it's probably something a little bit interesting. So. Oh, fantastic! Oh, that's great. That's a really great question because I know a lot of people are talking about hobby birds right now in Calgary. A yeah. lot of people, including myself, didn't know that we had um, hummingbirds come through Calgary. Oh, but well, we actually have three species that breed within wow. Calgary. Um, ruby throat hummingbird, rufous hummingbird, and calliope hummingbird. Um, you can actually see all three of them at Weaselhead near Glenmore Reservoir. So that's always an interesting place to go. Um, yeah, hummingbirds. Yeah, and coming from Ontario, that. Um, we only got one species of hummingbird. So here in Calgary, uh, we get three. So that's really, that's really a treat. Oh, wow. That is great. That is so great. Well, listen, I don't see any more questions popping up here. Thank you for the great ones that already came, came uh, to us on Zoom. And uh, we've got a few people watching with us live on Facebook. It'll stay on Facebook after too. So if you're not able to watch with us right now, hopefully we'll be able to pick it up after because I know there'll be lots to learn from Gavin in the next little bit here. Already are actually. So that's great. Um, yeah. So why don't I let you take it from here and, and, uh, if you need anything from us, I'm right here for you, but really looking forward to learning about birding 101 with Gavin. Yeah. All right. So let me uh, just, I'm just going to pause here for a second, just get sorted out. So just give me like 30 seconds. And yeah. Yeah. You bet. Of course. Take your time. Yeah. It's great to have everybody joining us from all over let's see we've got several volunteers and quite a few people also on on facebook live we've got musna and kate and alvin hey guys thanks for joining us and i can't see the names of the others but it's good to have you here So next week, as Gavin's getting set up, I'll just say we have two more of the Wildlife Wednesdays. Next week, we have Paloma and Michael from FLAP, uh, Fatal Aid Awareness in Toronto. They are the folks who started this whole thing just about 30 years ago. Michael did the first uh, work very, very early in Toronto. And uh, Paloma and Michael are just fantastic to talk to. And um, I'm so excited to have them on for an evening. So do make sure you tune in next week. And then the week after we have a special treat with Brian Keating, who is going to share some stories with us and leave us in a very upbeat uh, mood I'm uh, quite sure of, because uh, if you haven't heard Brian speak before, it's a real treat. He's so positive and uh, yeah, his joy for wildlife and adventure really spills over. So make sure you gather up your kids and get your jammies on and curl up next to the laptop for uh, to enjoy with uh, with Brian Keating as well. All right. That's in two weeks. Nice. That's yeah. great timing. I, I unfortunately wasn't able to start the watch party in Calgary Birds. Um, it wouldn't okay. let me for some reason. So, um, yeah, well. Okay, well, you start. Maybe is it shared over to that group? Because uh, it's, it's live now. I can see it live. But okay. uh, when I tried to start the watch party, maybe if you tried it, it would work. I don't know. But I'll give it a shot while you're talking. Yeah. All right. Let's get started here. Um, there's the upcoming uh, upcoming Wildlife Wednesdays. I think uh, Kathleen just went over that for you, all you. Sorry for not changing the slide there, but let's get into the presentation here. So uh, birding in Calgary, how and where to start. So essentially, I'm just going to be talking about some basics in birding. Uh, what you need to get started, what some good things to know, and then a few places that I recommend going to bird um, in within the city limits of Calgary. Uh, so why birding? Why 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 does why do people think birding is such a great thing to do? 
uh, it can it can really be done from anywhere. It can be done from your house. It can be done driving to work. Uh, it can even be done at work. I've heard of people in downtown Calgary having some pretty impressive lists of birds they've seen uh, outside their office window. Um, it's also very rewarding um, getting out and seeing some interesting birds that you haven't really seen that much before, spending some time with those birds, um, seeing some rarities. It's always fun. Um, I, you can't really have a bad day of birding, even if you don't see that many birds, you're going outside and getting out in nature. So you really can't lose. It's relatively inexpensive. It's not like you need to pay a membership fee or pay any fee for anything really other than equipment, um, which you can uh, decide to spend thousands of dollars on, or you can uh, remain within a decent budget and still have a very rewarding experience. Um, some studies have also suggested that birding has some uh, pretty good mental health benefits. So um, yeah, you really can't lose at birding, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so what equipment is needed? Um, really only two things that I think are essential for birding, which are binoculars and a good field guide. Um, you can obviously buy a spotting scope. I really recommend spotting scope and having a camera is nice too. You get to take some photos, um, document the birds you see. And if you find something interesting, you can get some proof. Um, but really all you need is binoculars and a good field guide. Uh, so binoculars, when, when buying binoculars, what should you look for? Uh, you should look for the magnification. Um, I usually get, recommend getting an eight magnification or a 10 magnification, excuse me, with uh, eight magnification. Uh, I personally enjoy eight. Uh, I know some people absolutely love their uh, 10 magnification and that's fine too. It's really all about personal preference. Uh, with objective lens size, um, I wouldn't get anything smaller than 32. Um, I have eight by 42. So the larger the size of the objective lens, the more light it lets in. Um, and I, yeah, I, I like to have a lot of light, um, especially at the end of the day, that's always nice to have. Um, field of view, um, what, how wide um, your view is. Um, with the 10 by 42, it narrows that um, quite a bit. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why I like eight by 42. Um, and comfort, is it light enough? How does it feel in your hand? Does the focus wheel feel right? Um, do you, yeah, it's really up to you with comfort. Like, what do you want to be carrying around for eight hours a day when you're walking around the forest looking for birds? So, I mean, it's really up to you. Um, if you don't want to be walking around with a pair of binoculars you absolutely hate and don't want to carry, that that's not very fun. And also another thing, um, the warranty. Um, Vortex has a very good warranty. They'll replace or fix binoculars. Um, doesn't really matter um, what happened as long as you didn't uh, run over it with your car or take a hammer to it, they'll replace it for you. So um, yeah, a good warranty because you never know what's going to happen. You might fall, you might misalign them by accident, you might drop them. So it's always good to have a nice warranty. Some mid-range recommendations I have are the Vortex Diamondback. That's actually my first pair of binoculars that I bought. Um, I saved up for about two years and I was pretty pumped when I got those. So um, yeah, I, I still have my pair. They're, they're pretty beat up at this point. I've upgraded a couple of times since, but um, yeah, they're a great binocular to start out with. Uh, the Nikon Monarch 7s are quite good as well. Um, very similar to the Diamondbacks. Uh, same with the Zeiss Terra ED. Uh, they're all good options and um, you can get them here. The best place to get them in Calgary, I think, is the camera store. They have probably the best prices in, in Calgary. And I think the so, uh, Calgary um, Wild Bird Store, you can actually rent binoculars too. Yes. So if you wanted to try some out, yeah. you could, they lent some to us for... Um, yeah, that that's also a good place to... They, uh -huh. they have the Vortex brand now, so that... Uh, my personally, I love Vortex. I have a pair of Vortex razors now, which I absolutely love. Um, but yeah, you can get them at the Wild Bird store as well. Um, camera store is a great selection. Um, one thing I would say before buying a pair of binoculars would be to try it out in the hand before you actually buy them, uh, just so you know what you're getting into. 
you can watch as many videos on YouTube or articles online as, and read as many articles as you want, but you really don't know what they're like until you've actually used them yourself. So that, that would be my advice uh, for when you're looking for binoculars. That's for sure. Do you happen to know if the camera store has uh, used binoculars for sale? I know they have a great used camera section. Yeah, I also I've, helped to sort of save an event. I've and bought fantastic. quite a few things from the camera store, uh, and their, especially their used section. I got I got a great deal on my new lens there. Um, I don't know if they uh, have binoculars on consignment. I'm not sure. Um, you'd probably have to check with them, but I I think they would. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I really yeah. don't know. Um, I was asking. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Um, yeah. So field guides and apps. Um, I, I start off with a local field guide. You don't want to be overwhelmed by some bird that creeps into the Southwest corner of Arizona. And that's about all you see of it in North America. Um, that can get a little bit uh, overwhelming if you're just starting out. Um, Birds of Alberta is a really good guide. Uh, it's by Chris Fisher and John Acorn. I know a lot of people absolutely love this book. Um, and it is, yeah, it, has quite a, quite a lot of interesting information where to see these birds has the location the best sites to see these birds in Alberta too um, but yeah starting off locals always a good idea you can always buy a better field guide or well, I shouldn't say better a uh, more detailed field guide later my favorite field guide is the Sibley guide to birds um, the second edition it's very comprehensive um, very good for solving those uh, tricky ID puzzles and yeah, I absolutely love it. They also have a good app too. Um, I think it's about $20 for the app, about $40 for the book. Uh, the app is, the app has a lot of songs um, and it's very good. My only complaint about the app is that a lot of the songs are from the Eastern region. So when in the Western region, you don't, you get, there's a little bit of variation. So the songs don't always sound exactly the same, um, but a good free app to get is Merlin Bird ID. Um, it's connected with eBird and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so you can see your life list on this app. You can, uh, it doesn't, it's not as detailed as some field guides, but it has uh, a lot of good information. Also has some good audio uh, songs on it, songs and calls. So I'll talk a little bit. Yeah, I should, should ask if there are any questions about the equipment part. Um, but if not, we're just, we can just go into identification here. I don't see any questions just yet, but I, I will definitely let you know if I see any. All right, yeah, so identification. Um, I really say identification is largely a process of just elimination. Um, it, is it, if it's smaller than this or bigger than this, um, Cornell has, um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, I should say, has a, um, good uh, four keys to identification is what they called them. So they, I added them in here just to show you uh, kind of the basics to ID. Um, but really it is a process of elimination and it, it takes some practice too. So um, I always know uh, Gus Yaki, who is one of uh, the founders of the Friends of Fish Creek Bird Walks always said, there are two types of birders, ones that make mistakes and then liars. So um, yeah, don't, uh, don't get discouraged if you get something wrong. That's a good lesson for sure. And Gus has been doing this a lot of years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so size and shape, um, compare it relatively to other birds. Don't necessarily think of size in inches or centimeters or feet. Um, I love this uh, photo on the left here because it shows so many different birds and their comparative sizes to each other. I think that's pretty cool. Um, if, you, if you're if you like describing a bird, you can either say it's like small as a sparrow, smaller than a sparrow, um, larger than a robin, but smaller than a crow or smaller than a, go smaller than a goose, but larger than a crow. Um, yeah, so it's size is probably, the size and shape are probably very important. Uh, almost the, I, I don't know if they're most important but definitely up there in uh, the process of identifying birds. Um, after you've been doing it for a while, you don't really even think about it. You just see a robin, you're like, oh, there's a robin. And you, do, doesn't need, you don't even think about uh, the field marks, just kind of automatically registers in your mind. Uh, habitat is also very important. Um, you're probably not going to see a common merganser, which is a fish um 
eating duck, you're probably not going to see that bird um, singing from the treetops. Um, but you're probably also not going to see um, a yellow warbler swimming around in the water diving for fish. So um, habitat's very important. Um, you, you'll learn what birds are normally found in which habitat, which is also helpful too, because you'll know what you're looking for uh, or listening for. Um, yeah, habitat. I, I love birding in different habitats. Um, personally, I like wetlands near forest because you get the most uh, diversity of birds um, around here. Uh, that's why I like birding. Probably my favorite place to bird in Calgary is the Glenmore Reservoir. You can scan the reservoir, walk into the weasel head. Uh, you'll hear tons of birds, uh, see a lot of birds out on the reservoir, especially during migration. And behavior too. Um, behavior is a very, uh, very interesting topic that I can't say I'm necessarily an expert on. Um, it's very complicated. Um, greater sage grouse have this very interesting display um, they do to attract mates on what they call lek, where all the males go to uh, display and um, show off to the females. Um, also, um, snow geese, very unique. They gather in groups of ten, like tens of thousands, even over a hundred thousand sometimes. And you can, uh, during migration, you can see that on the east of Calgary um, and especially in Saskatchewan. I was there a couple years ago and it was really overwhelming to see all these snow geese. And then you, then you have the challenge of picking out the Ross's goose, which is a little smaller uh, version of uh, Canada goose. Um, uh, I didn't, this is not my photo. I pulled this, uh, from the internet. Um, it's, uh, no, I've never seen a lack of greater sage grouse in Alberta. Their populations are, um, they're very endangered. Uh, actually you're not allowed, there's an emergency protection order. So you're not actually allowed to go anywhere near the, near the lack. Uh, so I think this bird was taken somewhere in the United States where their populations are much more stable. Uh, so color pattern, um, color pattern, uh, more color pattern than just um, color, but um, the pattern of color on a bird is very important as well. Um, you can see this really bright male house finch um, and a lark sparrow, very intricate uh, facial pattern on them. Uh, color can be a little bit confusing. Um, I remember when I first started birding, we were walking um, on a trail near uh, Trinity, Newfoundland, um, right along the coast. and we, I just started birding, so I didn't really know exactly what I was doing. Um, we see this giant, uh, very large bird off in the distance with the light shining on it. Looks like it has almost a orange breast, orange head, um, and an orange tail. Um, so we're thinking maybe Baltimore Oriole, maybe a robin, but it has these talons and a hooked beak. Um, and it slowly, slowly glided down um, below the cliff that we were on. Oh, you can see that it's a bald eagle and it was just the sun shining on it. So that really shows that um, the uh, that light can play a factor too. Um, and also color can be deceiving as I just said, but uh, if you see a raven or what you think is a raven swimming around in the water, um, going in and out of the reeds feeding, um, it might not be a raven, it might be like an American coot. Um, they're both very similar in color, but their behavior, habitat, um, and size and shape is uh, different. So that's why I say color. Um, you don't necessarily need it, but it's always nice to have. Think of birds as people. Um, this I named this guy Sam. Uh, he's about an average height. Uh, he's in shape. He likes running in the park. Uh, that's a pretty good description for Sam, I think. Um, or you could say Sam is 5'11", 182 pounds. He's 32 years old and originally from Manitoba and he has blue eyes. I mean, that's that's overwhelming. That's confusing. Um, don't explain. Uh, I don't like explaining birds to people with like, if I said this wing is however many centimeters in width, that wouldn't be uh, very helpful. Uh, so then now I'm going to go into uh, locations of where to find birds. Uh, Carburn Park, one of my favorite places to bird, especially in the winter and early spring. You can see lots of uh, 
water birds, lots of ducks in the winter, especially. Um, it gets pretty chilly there, so you might want to dress warmly. Um, and migrating songbirds pass through there as well. It's such a, um, a surprise. I've lived in Calgary since the mid 80s, and I only went to Carbon Park for the first time about a year ago. Been missing it, out. I was so missing out all these years. And here it's right beside Glenmore and Deerfoot. And it's like, what could yeah. possibly be in there that's wild? Yeah, I know. But it's crazy how much wildlife is in yeah. there. Like, I was with full I was, sets of antlers. It's just it's crazy. I know. Uh, I was leading a group out there uh, in January, and there's this large um, shopping center on the other side of the river, and there's like an Ikea yeah. a car dealership, and I was like pointing to birds. And I'm like, okay, so it's right in line with the Ikea. It's right in line with the eye in the Ikea, so just put your binoculars on the eye and go straight down, and you'll see this bird. Um, so <laughs> That's handy. Yeah, yeah. It, it was nice to have a few landmarks on the other side of the river. Um, yeah. <laughs> Another place is Glenmore Reservoir and the Weasel Head. If you want to go birding in the morning right now, I, this is the place I think you should go. I absolutely love this location. Migrating water birds on the reservoir in the in migration season. Um, there's some really interesting birds there too. You can sometimes see scoters, long-tailed ducks, sometimes Pacific loons. Um, so some uh, rarer birds are seen there in migration too. It's quite deep, um, that's probably why. Um, lots of breeding songbirds. Um, down in the weasel head flats and also the three species of hummingbirds that I mentioned are also found there. Um, so I was going to ask you if you were there yeah. looking for hummingbirds yeah. are you looking lower to the ground by flowers or where where about yeah, I'm, I'm really looking up in the trees um, for the rufous hummingbirds. Um, it's kind of hard to describe but there's a hill and then there's a smaller path that just goes straight um, when you're going down the hill and then you get to this um, water outflow. And the hum rufous hummingbirds usually hang out in that area there. Um, calliope hummingbirds are usually found just, there's this little open meadow and they're found in there. Um, if anyone, yeah, if anyone wants to know where they're found, just uh, send me a message on Facebook or send me an email and I'll be happy to help. It's really, it's hard to explain. Um, Maybe, uh, okay. But yeah, yeah it, they're, uh, they're in that area and I'd definitely be happy to help you out if you don't know where they are. Perfect, thank you. In the Inglewood Bird Sanctuary, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this location. Migrating songbirds, water birds, and really great horned owls. A lot of people see great horned owls in there. Um, I haven't birded here qu as, uh, qu a lot. Um, I'd like to do more birding in there. Uh, I just usually end up going to Glenmore Carver, and those are kind of my two go-tos, um, and Confederation Park, which I'll talk about here in a second. But Inglewood, yeah, it's a good place. Um, I. I, I haven't been in Calgary um, that long, so I don't know what it was like before the flood, but I've heard from some people that uh, were here before the flood that it was a little bit better, but I mean, I couldn't tell you. So um, you'd have to ask someone else, but whenever I've been there, it's been a pretty good day. Uh, this winter, we had a day where we saw 19 bald eagles um, in I think about a three hour period at Inglewood. So, I mean, that was pretty cool. Um, usually one of the places we start seeing the first gulls of the year. So yeah, definitely. Yeah interesting location to check out and this one's close to my house so I'm kind of biased with this one this one's about five minutes down the road at Confederation Park it's where you see a lot of migrating songbirds in the spring especially the fall um yeah it's it's a really good spot there are about three locations there we really see a lot of the birds but um a lot of interesting birds you don't normally see in the city I uh, saw lots of black hole warblers um what else? Red starts I saw there this spring. Um, yeah, in in this in the fall, you've seen tons of species of warblers. Um, yeah, so it's a really good really good spot to be. But at, at those times of year, I should add, I've walked around there in July, and to be honest, I haven't really been that impressed with it. But in migration, it's it's just alive with birds on some days. So. And the last one, Fish Creek Provincial Park. I think everyone knows this um, park. It's There's such a variety of habitat. You can go to the West End Shannon Terrace and you can see uh, um, lots of birds that are normally found in the foothills, like American three-toed woodpecker, sometimes black-backed woodpecker, towns in solitaire, uh, northern pygmy owl. Um, and th that's all within the city. And in the East End, 
Mallard Point's another good place to see warblers. Um, a lot of breeding birds in here too. It's where we host our annual uh, bird camp. Unfortunately, that had to be canceled this year because of COVID, but it's Fish Creek is such an expansive area with lots of habitat, especially for it being in, in the city. Um, it's a really good place to go and go and find birds. You could probably see quite a variety. Yes, yes, ospreys can be seen there too. Um, Sakomi Lake is where I've seen them. Uh, Ospreys can be really be seen anywhere along the Bow River too. So if you take a walk uh, along the Bow River, um, you have a decent chance of seeing them. Now let's talk about uh, eBird. Um, so eBird is an online database uh, website that I I used since 2012. I was just the just the little guy starting out in birding, and I uh, got on eBird, started entering in my sightings and. Yeah, I've entered in about 1,200 checklists now um, into eBird. Uh, and here's some reasons to use eBird. Uh, provides data to help with conservation, helps with some conservation efforts with birds, helps uh, scientists monitor populations of birds. Uh, what's even, what's important is just uploading regular bird sightings, like what you see in your backyard, what you see at your local park, it doesn't have to be exceptional. Uh, they also track absences of species. So if some species are uh, simply not present that can be a sign of something that can be that can be an indicator so um it also keeps nice organized personal lists um keeps a year list keeps a day list a month list for whatever location you like so if you like stats um ebird's got you covered with that and explore data to plan birding or the trips and learn more about each species in the explore species um tab here or not tab um I don't know what I'd call that, but anyways, uh, you can type in a species and um, you can read about the species, see where it's found, see some great photos and audio of the species. Um, you can also go to explore hotspots. So let's say um, took a trip down to uh, Arizona or something. You can uh, somewhere in the states you can look um, where to where to bird. I that really helped me last year doing my big year, especially the species maps. Um, target species, um, which is the species you need, and it shows you. You can also subscribe to rare bird alerts, you know, when something interesting or rare is spotted. Um, and yeah, it's very, it's very comprehensive. I, I'm a big fan of eBird. Um, um, yeah, it's, and yeah, it's a great, um, can't really say a bad thing about eBird. So um, yeah, it, I love yeah. it. It's run by Cornell University, is that yeah, right? Yeah, Cornell Lab of Ornithology runs it, yeah. Right. I know that a couple of years ago when um, volunteering with Calgary Wildlife, um, I know they've, I'm not sure if they use this routinely because they've got such knowledgeable staff there, but I know there was one bird that we needed to release and we were able to go into eBird to find where the most species were so that we could release it back into a good spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Friends. You, can, you can look and you can be like, oh, well, there were seven of these birds reported here on Tuesday, but there were only five on Wednesday. So you can, yeah. you can really, yeah. yeah you you cool. can look up everything about birds on there. You could learn a lot just by, just by playing around with it. Like, I mean, I've spent countless hours when I should be doing schoolwork. Um, <laughs> we won't tell. Playing on eBird. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, community events um nature calgary has some great field trips friends of fish creek uh, provincial park society they have um weekly bird walks that you can register for um yeah uh i i lead uh, sometimes on sunday mornings with uh friends of fish creek um yeah we have a great group there um and we just go out and see what we can find and uh always have a good time out in the field um well, bird store, um, they have some seminars. I do some of their uh, bird ID workshops and uh, I lead um, some walks for them, some field trips occasionally. I, uh, yeah, um, hopefully we'll be able to get some uh, field trips and uh, walks and everything set up in the near future, but who knows where this is taking us. But I mean, let's, let's try and stay optimistic, so. And just the last thing I want to touch on here is just ethics. Um, pretty much this is just don't be a jerk when you're birding. 
uh, respect and promote um, birds in their environment. Don't chase uh, birds back and around and everywhere. Don't stress them out. Um, uh, respect and promote the uh, birding community and its individual members. When you're out, you're always a representative of the birding community. Don't make people hate birders. We're not harmful. We don't want that. And just respect and promote the law and the rights of others. So that really means just don't go on people's private property. Um, and yeah, be, be good to people. I guess now that would mean staying at least two meters away from people um, and following all the public health guidelines. But um, yeah. And the people. No, that's, yeah, that's really important stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah I guess because yeah. you hear about people about posting nests and things like that. Is yeah, that... yeah, you don't necessarily want to draw attention to nesting birds. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to have people going and cutting, cutting down branches and uh, interfering with nesting birds. Um, yeah, that's not something that you want to have. Um, also sharing, sharing locations and stuff. I don't really see a big issue with sharing locations of birds that are like, um, there have been birds that have been, you know, 500 meters out on the lake that everyone's standing on the shoreline. That bird is not, doesn't care about the people on the shoreline. Um, but if you're chasing a warbler um, or a songbird around in the forest, that's probably disturbing it. So try, if you know of birds like that, try and uh, be respectful of them and yeah. Right, that's awesome. That's really good. Yeah, there was a post, actually, Chris Fisher put up a post uh, recently about the legalities around nests and... Yeah, the, um, yeah. Also, yeah. also some laws on, uh, yeah, migratory birds and everything. So you have to be aware, aware of those too. Yeah, for sure. Even collecting feathers. Um, I didn't know this until recently, like, because I used to love um, if I saw a feather, because um, some of the other activities that I'm involved with um feathers are, are a big uh, symbol and so when i see feather it you know i think it was nice to pick up but then a couple of years ago i learned that's not legal so really yeah even yeah yeah even feathers you need to leave them any any birds bird parts and I, I guess um somebody on the line who's more knowledgeable than i am on this i think it throws back to the days of hats when ladies hats were a big thing and and so birds were threatened by people collecting feathers so it wouldn't be just picking the feather up off the ground it would actually they'd have to get yeah, the bird, feathers, get the feather definitely. so yeah all the the parts and the nest and everything that are protected so if you ever have questions about should i pick this up or take this uh air on the side of caution and don't and then contact somebody who knows about them to find out if that's legal and okay yeah no that's really cool the thing with the uh, feathers is people used to have these great these hats with these white plumes and that really hurt the great egret population. People would just go out, shoot them and take their feathers and make hats and everything. And that really hurt their population. There's, I think they're starting to rebound now. So that's good. Uh, so in Ontario, I see lots of great egrets. Um, I go birding down Point Peely area. So yeah, it's always, uh, but yeah, I think they're, I think they were driven, their populations were driven down quite a bit because of people uh, shooting them for feathers and hats. Kind of, kind of like beavers, right? Wow. Kind of ironic, isn't it? They're so beautiful. Well, yeah. Kill it and, yeah. But yeah, no, that's really, that's recent because that was such a huge uh, industry with hat making and, mm -hmm. and such. So yeah. all those. have the egrets come back in population? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how abundant they were in the beginning, but they're, I've certainly from what, since I started birding, I've seen more egrets um, than when I started, but um, I don't know if that's me getting better at spotting birds or uh, there be there being more egrets around. We don't really get egrets in Alberta. Um, one spot, Roshan Sands Provincial Park, it's really hit and miss there. You might see them. But um, in Ontario, where I lived for uh, I think six years, I uh, used to see them on a pretty regular basis. Fantastic. And I see there's a couple of questions. So are you, are you ready for more questions, Kevin? Yeah. Awesome. Let's do it. Um, I have heard of people getting bird recordings to help with memorizing bird sounds. Do you have any resources you can recommend? Yeah, birding by ear is very helpful. Um, I know, um, when I was, um, up in Cold Lake, I estimated that about 70% of the songbirds that we located were located by sound first before we actually saw them. 
Um, and that really is, um, you just have to spend time and listen to recordings. Um, songs, songs vary from individual to individual and region to region. So that's a little bit tricky too. Um, mm. But um, yeah, it's- I think that the app actually that you mentioned, um, yeah. let's see, I actually have it here. Mark Wire. The Mer- well, I have Merlin Bird ID and they have yeah. songs. They have songs okay. on there too. And Sibley does have songs. You can find songs online on Zeno Canto, on uh, Macaulay Library by eBird. You can find uh, recordings everywhere. And, and learning bird songs is almost like learning a new language. Uh, eventually, uh, become fairly fluent in it, and you'll be able to pick out different bird songs from far away. Um, but for sure, it's it's not 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 necessarily an easy thing. Uh, I think what I what helped me learn a lot of songs is starting out fairly young um but you can never get too old to learn new things so well our co-founder you know dr scott level at uh, st mary's well yeah yeah, no one loved dr scott he can actually name every single species in north america by ear yeah that's crazy We, we should test him on that sometime too we should that'd be kind of fun yeah, I should just get him, give him some call notes and everything and see if he yeah. passes the test. I think it'd be fun for us. Yeah. We'd like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, th- I think we should uh, we should look into that. Absolutely. So I had somebody have Another ask- Wildlife Wednesday quiz, Scott. Oh, that'd be great. I, I'm sure all the volunteers are, are in for sure. <laughs> it's a good study. sport, too. Yeah. Uh, uh let's see uh and unfortunately he couldn't be with us too because he's actually uh out doing research out in the field so we hope to have him back with us soon because we're missing him and melanie our other co-founder with calgary wildlife rehabilitation society she's the director of animal care at calgary wildlife um she would normally be here as well but they've got lots going on with uh spring with uh youngsters and so she said she's going to try to pop into your session uh a little later part i don't see her yet but i know she wants to be here for you gavin um i was going to mention too these sessions are um done our guests like gavin very generously is provided thank you very much for providing your time totally pro bono with no fee to any of us so thank you so so much um we've been asked in the past about if people can contribute or something as a thank you and um while you know we we just want to give this as a gift to the community we would actually be very grateful if you were so inclined to support calgary wildlife rehabilitation society they, um, last I spoke to Melanie, since January, they had more than 500 patients come through of wild animals from within Calgary. So anything from birds striking windows to um, baby beavers to baby skunks and fawns are now the big thing and uh, ducklings, geese, uh, raptors, you name it. So um, just want to mention that as well. And uh, has a great question here too. You guys have the best questions. Keep them coming. Um, could you comment on the differences and similarities between Alberta and Ontario in relation to species? Um, that's a really neat question because I do see too, like we were inspired by FLAP and Safe Rings Ottawa and they do see on their posts, I see quite a few differences in the birds, maybe even the volume of birds too during the flight path. Do you mind commenting on that? Yeah, let me just, uh, I just got a uh, message here from uh, Kent Liddell. Um, uh, he and uh, Barb Castell have a great uh, website called eBirders.com and they have live stream of their cameras. He just said, uh, check out um, BirdNet app for song ID. I forgot to mention that. And that one, that one's good too. I've never personally used it, but I've heard some good things about that. So uh, yeah, check, check them out at eBirders.com. Uh, oh, right very entertaining they have it on live at the wild bird store uh, so when you walk in there you can uh, when it opens again you can see uh, their mm-hmm. bird feeders so um, yeah very yeah great great yeah. and they do and they use eBird they have their sightings on eBird so if you want to check out what they've been seeing recently just look that up on uh, explore species so oh, or that's great. species maps right yeah but the differences in birding between uh, Alberta and Ontario um, yeah, I found the birding in Ontario is very concentrated. Um, 
there are more birds in general in the winter in Ontario. And I don't know, maybe it has something to do with the latitude of being in line with the northern uh, part of California down there. Um, but um, more birds in the winter I found. Um, in the in migration, migration there, are, I find to be a lot more concentrated spots, a lot more birds passing through. Um, and the birding is really concentrated in the fall and the spring and the summer. It really dies down there, to be honest. And a lot of people in Ontario don't even, a lot of the avid birders don't really even bird that much in the, in the summer. I'm not saying all of them. Like, I mean, people bird year round. Um, but a lot of people go into herps and uh, dragonflies uh, during the summer months. Um, but here we kind of have some, we have some more breeding birds in the area. Um, and I'm speaking just from the Southern Ontario perspective. So Northern Ontario, um, but um, yeah, for sure. Um, that is, there are differences, but really the, yeah, birding, it, it's, very, oh, it's always very similar at the same time. It's very different. There are different species, um, lots more species during migration in Point Pelee National Park. You can, in a day, see over a hundred species at one location. I think you'd have a pretty hard time doing that uh, somewhere during migration in Alberta. So, um, and I'm not saying a day, I'm saying in one location. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the, the difference. There, there are some differences, but they're more similar than not, I'd say. I was going to ask you too, when you have like a, a big year, like you did your big year, Alberta last year, it had over 300 species. Mm -hmm. So in order to actually count them, what is considered uh, an actual find? Can you, if you were to hear it and you were confident that that's what it was, can you count it if you hadn't seen it? And do you have to get a photo of it? Um, you don't have to get a photo of it. Usually I, I try and get a photo of it. I think I photographed like 85% of the birds I saw last year. Um, some of the birds I had didn't actually photograph were um, house sparrow and rock pigeon. So <laughs> some of the most common uh, birds. Um, but yeah, herd only, I only had like five or six herd only species. Um, and they were all pretty distinctive birds, like boreal owl and uh, yellow rail. Birds you're not really gonna gonna see uh, unless you specific, and you have to spend a lot of time trying to see them too. You'd have to get very lucky. So what is the greatest effort that you had to go to to find a particular bird? Do you have a, a fun story about? Oh. oh, can I think about that and come back to that question? Yes, you sure. Actually, can. no, I have it now. I have it. Um, I have to <laughs> flubber. So I put um, just a sec. I'm going to have to run inside because my uh, computer is uh, dying here. So I'm just going to move downstairs. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I can chat with the gang here. So, um, yeah, so it's nice to see uh, you've got still a few people on Zoom here with us. So feel free if any of you would like to um, unmute and share if you've had any uh, birding experiences that you'd like to share if you've been, if you're brand new at it or um, if you've been already doing it for a little while. I don't consider myself really, uh, wow, that was fast, Gavin. Yeah, <laughs> Lucky these guys don't have to listen to me for very long. I was just uh, asking the folks online here if they had any um, experiences they wanted to share, if they were brand new at birding or if people were experienced with it. Um, I see that Alvin has joined us on Zoom as well. He's always posting some amazing photos from his adventures. Um, but yeah. So did you did you think of uh, your story? I, I did. I did. Right. Um, so snowy plover. I saw it near the Saskatchewan border. It's a rare bird. I think there are only eight records in Alberta. I could be wrong, um, but not many records in Alberta. Um, Snowy plover. Snowy plover. It's usually found on the on the coast and the Gulf Coast. Um, no, it's it's a it's a rare bird in Canada. So seeing it anywhere in Canada is uh, quite 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 good. Um, but I had to walk through. I, we parked at the wrong spot. I was just at this location a couple weeks ago, and we just walked uh, and it wasn't even that bad. But I walked through this marshy, boggy area with tons of mosquitoes swarming me. Um, I was not dressed for it. I was wearing sandals and shorts um, and a short sleeved shirt, which is probably not the greatest idea. I thought I'd be walking on a beach, um, which I eventually got to 
um but um yeah and i eventually found it um but it was it was not the i had more mosquito bites i think than in my life than i like i i, I don't normally have mosquitoes coming after me so i think i had more mosquito bites that day than i had in, in my entire life before that i think i was telling you about this uh yesterday yeah. <laughs> oh man i sent there went to where you and your, you had your dad and you had to camp out in your car for a little while as well oh yeah common poor wills in uh grabburn road on uh, southern cypress hills provincial park yep that wasn't really that that was kind of fun that wasn't uh that difficult uh had it all set up and yeah it was it was nice we poor wills and cows were surrounding us yeah you had the um the back of your uh car was i think the photograph of everything you had all yeah I think that photograph got a lot of attention i kind of just put that on instagram oh. and i was like here we're going let's let's see what we can find this weekend and <laughs> i've been asked about that photo so many times yeah but it's uh yeah it was a good weekend we saw common poor worlds bullocks orioles greater sage grouse um we saw quite a few a uh, burrowing owl we saw a lot of a lot of different uh tough to find birds in alberta oh that's cool Actually, I just noticed too, if you want to, um, if, you're done sharing, if you're done sharing your screen, I think we could probably yeah, see just... better on Facebook there. There we go. Nice. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And Melanie actually just joined us. Hi, All Melanie. Right. Great. Good to have you. I was just saying, Melanie, you, um, I know you're tired from your day. Um, I was just explaining how you were hoping to join us, but that you were tied up at the center helping our wildlife, which is yeah. um, always appreciated. And um, so I'm glad that you you joined us. And actually, well, actually, Melanie, I see you're chatting in the comments. Would it be too much to put you on the spot to ask you about your day yesterday? Because you had a very special release. You can say no if you're no day. that's totally fine yeah sorry i didn't turn on my mic because i didn't want to um interrupt gavin there but yeah yesterday was a, a pretty amazing day so we had a uh first year swainson's hawk that we had to overwinter because um it had flown through a flare stack so we we needed it to molt before we could release and um so yeah we released it yesterday at Siksika nation with um norm running rabbit i don't know if any of you guys have met him but he's a great yeah <laughs> kathleen has yeah he's, he's a fantastic guy and he kind of heads up the animal services um department there on the reservations so yeah we went and released the swainsons and he took us to a very special spot so it was a sacred burial ground for uh the blackfoot people and we released the Swainsons there yesterday it was yeah it was beautiful beautiful location there were ground or gophers running around everywhere so um oh, yeah wow. there's lots to eat yeah yeah it was good oh i have tears in my eyes that's beautiful Aww. is the Swainsons hawk is that is that very uh rare no they're fairly common here um gavin can probably tell you more about the Swainsons because he's a big birding guy but yeah they're they're fairly common here they do migrate um, and they'll feed on, they usually feed on other birds and, and some small rodents and stuff. And then as they migrate down to Mexico area, they'll actually feed on grasshoppers. They eat grasshoppers. So yeah, they're kind of a neat hawk because yeah, it's, it, they're pretty cool animals. Oh, wow. Thank, thank you so there. much for sharing that. I was really excited, but I wasn't sure if we were allowed to share yet before. You oh, of course. Yeah. We tried to see <laughs> some pictures, but with all the releases, you never know, right? How it's going to go. It just kind of happens mm -hmm. really quickly. So your pictures end up like a blur of a butt flying away or something, but yeah, <laughs> it did wow. happen. It happened. Did you get a video? Uh, yeah, actually. So there was one girl that came out with Norm. I think she ended up getting video. I haven't seen it yet. Um, Norm hasn't sent it. So my guess is it probably didn't turn out super great, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, we got a photo of him flying away at least so mm -hmm. yeah i was gonna say he's in the field a lot too so maybe he uh yeah he hasn't had a chance to send it but that that is so awesome yeah. thank you yeah. So much. That, yeah if you drive along the highway um that's gonna that's a very good place to uh see swain's hogs number one highway heading east i see them quite a bit along there um yeah. and red-tailed hawks so driving along uh 
I don't know if that's considered distracted driving or not. I, I know, <laughs> I know a couple of people that have gotten actually tickets for uh, driving with binoculars up. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, just looking, looking, seeing if there are any hawks and then trying to find out what they are. But, yeah. Did you just say they were driving with their binoculars? Yeah, just this? slow <laughs> driving along the road. They're like, oh, let's check that out. And then they get pulled over. Ah. But, um, yeah, it makes a good story. I don't know. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Just pull over. I think that's the, that's the lesson there. I know with, uh, with COVID, I've practically forgotten how to drive. I drove to Melanie's uh, place with um something that she needed for one of our sessions and I'm like oh <laughs> city's so different but you practically forget to drive so adding binoculars into that would be a very very bad idea uh, I, I always keep a I those uh, vortex diamondbacks I was talking about my first pair of binoculars I always keep them uh in the back pocket of the driver's seat so if I'm if I'm ever out I can just reach back and grab them and uh look and see what see what they're all you never know you could be at the parking lot of the grocery store and you might see something that's interesting so you never you never ne never know what you're gonna find some birds have turned up in the weirdest places i mean dumps and sewage lagoons are some of the best places for birding dumps and sewage lagoons noted. yeah and gulls in the dumps and uh, shorebirds and sometimes waterfowl in the sewage lagoons yeah well that burring owl that we got last year hit a window of an olive garden restaurant oh, yeah. <laughs> so it ended up in the parking lot and that's how people found it. They were pulling up to go have dinner and, and found this owl there. Yeah. 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 Probably wouldn't need around. binoculars for that one. But I mean, I don't know how many no. growing owl records there are for the city limits, but there can't be that many. Like, I mean, that's a, that's a very It's lost very bird. rare. Yeah. Yeah. So when I talked to the uh, biologist with AAP, he said the only other record they have of a burring owl within city limits was from the 1940s. Oh, yeah. I'd buy that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't and that, and unfortunately, yeah. their populations are declining. Uh, yeah. Also, habitat loss and agriculture. But um, yeah, they're 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 so cute. I mean, yeah, I got to spend some time with one uh, by Red Cliff and Medicine Hat that area last year, and it was really special. I just sat on a fence post, maybe half an hour. I just pulled over and got some great photos of it. You just kind oh, of that's great. yeah. yeah. Well, that's really neat. So say somebody on the call heard that species and like, I want to go see a burrowing owl. Yeah. Then I guess that they could look at uh, eBird and see where people have spots well, in a uh, general location. And then as long as like you said, they're respectful of spacing and and the animal, you're not disturbing the animal or nest or anything, mm -hmm. they could go and observe yeah. with some binoculars. Burrowing owls are actually considered sensitive on eBird. So eBird filters are sighting, so you can't uh, see them publicly. Um, oh, interesting. Don't want that many people going and disturbing them. So, um, but yeah, the southeastern area of the province is where they're found. So if you drive around there and you just have to put in the time, um, yeah. you'll be able to find them. Just start driving up and down the... Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Tend to be in areas where there are lots of ground squirrels. So, uh, abandoned ground squirrel, uh, badger burrows. Look in, look in those areas. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's, uh, that's there where are. Burrows are yeah. Sorry, what was that? That's that's where they get their name, burrowing owl. Yes. Yeah. This makes sense. Yeah. And what do they eat? Do they eat gophers, or do they? Because they're pretty little themselves. Or they uh, they, they eat, yeah, I think they. I don't know. Their diet consists mostly of insects, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense because they're pretty I was, in, I, I'm, this, I was like eight when I saw my first burrowing owl, Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan. And uh, we saw them hunting uh, through the spotting scope at, at, in the evening. And they, they took some grasshoppers and brought them back to their young. We saw about four or five young, I think. Um, and there were a couple nests in that area. So that was... Uh, yeah, very small roads, most insects. Yeah, um, they, I've yeah, I've never seen them hunt rodents, but I've seen them hunt insects a couple of times. So they're they're super cool owls. Like I think they've got to be up there on my list of favorite owls. They're then they're so small too. Oh, that is so so cool, and I'm glad that Eber does protect uh, sensitive species like that. That is really good. Yeah. Um, and Mel made a comment about um, it's the same with uh, bat hibernacula and roosts. Um, oh, keeping them on the down low. That's yeah. Really 
Mm -hmm. I see a couple of questions here. Um, so Gavin, how long have you been birding for? Which I think is, a, I'm really glad that this was asked. Thanks yeah. TJ. Cause um, I think part of the wonderful thing about birding is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong cause I'm the new kid on the block with this stuff but it seems like any age young or less young can do this you can do it at home you can do it at your school um if you need more rare species you may have to go a little further but it seems like anybody can do it so how did how did you get started and and how yeah. old were you so so i started noticing birds around age five or six um my dad's a, a biologist that a population ecologist that works on birds um so he's been wearing on mostly grouse for for his career um and one spring, uh, my parents took me to Point Pigley National Park in the uh, most southern tip of Canada in May during the Festival of Birds. And I kind of got hooked, got home, started keeping track of all the birds I saw, got on eBird, and I kind of really no never slowed down. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, I just kind of got hooked. And that, yeah, Point Pigley is a beautiful spot. It's, it's my favorite place. I was looking forward to going there this year. I was hoping to... Uh, lead some of the walks there this year but uh fortunately the festival is canceled still holding out hope for next year and hopefully we can um yeah if anyone wants to go to point peely it's an amazing place so uh yeah and the so festival sorry where is it generally so it's, it's the southernmost tip of canada mainly in canada so it's uh hmm. southern ontario it's by windsor um yeah on ebird i think it is the hot spot with the most species recorded anywhere in canada no way Wow, that would make sense though because it's a huge point. migratory. Well, they're kind of long points, kind of creeping up to Point Peely. So, hmm. Okay. Let's see. Uh, here's another question. Valerie asks: We had a robin nesting on the light above our back door, and she laid four eggs, at least three of which hatched. However, the day after you checked on them, the nest must have been raided by crows or something early in the morning, and the little family was taken. So what would that have been, do you think? Is that pretty common? Uh, I mean, I, I, I honestly can't tell you what that could have been. Um, but I mean, yeah, crows seems like a good guess. Maybe magpies, um, maybe, uh, I'm trying to think. We, we don't have really that many raccoons here. In Ontario, we have quite a few raccoons. Um, hmm. yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, there's a pocket. There's a pocket of raccoons yeah. kind of in the south. Okay. So depending on where you live, Valerie, yeah. it's possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't seen, I live in the Northwest, so we haven't seen that many raccoons. Okay. We haven't seen any raccoons, but in Ontario, we it was backed onto a conservation area. We saw the coyotes running by and the deer and the mm -hmm. raccoons and skunks and everything. Saw lots of wildlife. Um, but I guess that's just uh, kind of uh, nature and how it goes sometimes. I mean, you can't really control that, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just it's just interesting because then you're, you're seeing like, the whole circle of life going on in your backyard as well. Thanks for sharing that, Valerie. I guess it wasn't really a question. It was more of a observation, yeah. but thanks for sharing that. Cause actually we're seeing a lot of questions like that on the different birding sites about people who are seeing different mm -hmm. things happening. People wanting to get flickers to stop drilling holes in their house and that kind of thing. <laughs> Put up flicker houses. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I guess that is one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Do anybody else uh, just check Facebook really quick and see if there were any questions that were on there? <laughs> you guys can chat while I do that if you'd like. Yeah, anyone anyone have any more questions? And feel free to unmute and um, and comment too because you're you're feeling um, hi Gavin, this is Anne. I am. I just wanted to ask you a question. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, I have a place out in Invermere, yeah. and there's sort of a little gully right, uh, you know, just a ways from our place. Mm -hmm. And there was a very tall dead tree there. Mm -hmm. And originally, that tree had an osprey nest in it. Yeah. For like probably ten years in a row. Nice. Um, and then one summer, all of a sudden, these bald eagles showed up and for about six weeks, they were having this major war over who was going to end up with the nest and the eagles won. So I guess my question, and that's been the same, well, that the eagle nest has been used 
about 10 or 12 years in a row too. So what I'm getting at, my question is, is it safe to assume that that was the same pair of birds, like both with the osprey coming back to the same nest as it was with the eagles? Like, would that be the same pair coming back to the same nest every year for that many years in a row? Yeah, I, I, I think it's definitely likely that it could be the same pair. I mean, there's no, I guess there's, uh, unless you've been paying very close attention, I guess there's no, not, necess not necessarily a way to know a hundred percent, but um, yeah, I think it, I think it's fairly likely that it was the same pair with the bald eagles there. Cool. Yeah. It's amazing. And we always, there was a couple of incidents every year with the babies when they were first fledging and they're kind of, you know, they're kind of idiots in the tree. They're landing in the trees. They're way too big for the branch they're landing on. We found them in the middle of the, of the road, sort of going out to the main road and they would, you know, kind of skitter along the ground. But anyway, I was yeah, always wondering if it was the same uh, pair or like not. Got hit by cars or anything. Uh, yeah, not that I saw, but um, it was funny to watch them because they're really- yeah, They're, they're, they're kind of awkward, aren't they? They're very goofy, yeah. Anyway, yeah. thanks for your stories. I've been really enjoying them. Yeah, thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for thanks for being here tonight. I saw one uh, unmute come on. Was there a question there? Oh, hello. Hi, CJ. <clears throat> uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, hey, Gavin. I've just got a question. Um, how rare are snowy owls? So I live in like Southeast Calgary. Yeah. And like I'm reading the Birds of Alberta book. Okay. And apparently from what I'm seeing, um, you can find them in Southeast Calgary. And the reason why I'm asking this is because over like, like a few months ago, like maybe like February or March, yeah. I was walking home from a convenience store and I saw this bird, probably like size of a goose fly over like fly over me and mm. went through like the the tops of roofs and all that and I was like really fascinated by it but I wasn't quick enough to like take a photograph or anything yeah. but I was looking online I also looked at the birds of Alberta book mm. and I saw the pattern of the wings and it seemed to have like black spots and it was like a very white bird so yeah. I was wondering if snowy owls can be found within the city and if they are common to be seen around here. They're definitely not common in the city. I know I know they can be seen in the city. People have seen them on uh, telephone poles and um, fence posts near the outskirts of the city. Um, I know one was seen in Fish Creek this, this winter, I think. The best places to see them are definitely east of Calgary and south of Calgary. Um, in uh like agricultural fields driving on some side roads uh, that's a good way to find them but yeah definitely definitely that could have definitely been what you saw um yeah but uh could there be like another type of owl or maybe like a bird that flies mm -hmm. at night that could be like mistaken for a snowy owl well um yeah well great horned owls they're they're about the same size uh similar and then they're very similar similar they're in the same genus um and that would probably be more likely within the city limits um but it wouldn't be white um birds that would have been white um i guess no goose that would have been if it was in february that'd be on that really so um but yeah it could have been snow goose probably on a pelican maybe it, it, if it was huge it could have been a pelican or a swan um but <laughs> white and kind of like owl shaped wings and um like that, yeah, definitely could have been a. Uh... Oh, okay, cool. Okay, thank you. Hi, <laughs> Melanie. Uh, Point Peely Owl. I'm not seeing the photo. It won't let me download it. So, would you mind sharing what that is? Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to send it to you to see if I ID'd it properly. It was uh, what I thought a red faced screech owl. Yeah, that yeah, I, yeah, yeah. That I took at Point Peely. So, um, but yeah, that's too bad it won't open. I don't know. Maybe I can if email you, it just to you or something. Send it, 
to me as an email. Uh, okay. Uh, gmckinnonbird at gmail.com. Just send okay. that. Um, I've seen uh, lots of red morph uh, screech owls at Point Peely over the years. Uh, oh, last cool. year, so 2019 was actually, I think, the first or second time I'd actually seen a gray morph screech owl in the park. So. Oh, wow. That's excellent. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll email that to you after. Yeah, okay. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I'd wish I'd been able to hear this talk when I first started birding, because some of those things I kind of figured out through trial and error, but man, you made it so straightforward and easy to understand. So yeah, that was that was a really good explanation about like how to compare compare sizes and locations and that kind of thing. That was that was excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I don't see any more questions on uh, Facebook. Oh, thank you, Tracy, for your kind comment. Um, yes, please come back for the next one. And uh, she says, thanks, Gavin, for the, wow. the session. Thank you to be here. Yeah, we're really glad to have you here. And uh, if nobody has any more questions, I can uh, let you guys go. But um, if if people do have more, more questions about birding, Gavin, what would be the best thing for them to do? Contact you directly? Or you did mention a few other resources earlier too. Um, yeah. What would and you suggest? Feel free to send me an email or a message on Facebook. Um, my email is gmckinnonbird at gmail.com. Um, so if you want to uh, write that down and send me an email, feel free to do that. Um, we also have the Calgary Birds Facebook group. I don't know if anyone's a member of that here. Uh, I know we're trying to have a watch party on there, but I don't know if that worked. Um, but that's a, a that's a good place. Also, Alberta Birds Facebook group. There are a lot of knowledgeable people on both of those groups. So if you have a question, you can always post it on there and hopefully someone will be able to find an answer for you. Um, if you don't know what a bird is, there's the What's This Bird group by uh, American Birding Association. And that's that's a good place to find out if you're puzzled by something too. So That's terrific. And actually, um, I learned about Birds Calgary and yes. Chris Fisher on Blog. Twitter. Yeah. So I know the younger folks don't really like Twitter a lot, but if you're older like me, um, Twitter was great to go on. And if you had questions about birds, um, people are pretty interactive there and pretty helpful. And a lot of birders. Uh, last week was uh, Black Birders Week. We we missed that by a week, Gavin, but you had you planned um, before we knew uh, that it was Black Birders Week. But even that hashtag, if you go on, there's tons of great resources and great speakers and other different live presentations that are happening as well, I noticed. So yeah. So what would be uh, your one number one tip for people to um, to get started? If they wanted to go right now, what do you figure? If they wanted to go birding right now, uh, my tip to them would be get out and go. Uh, don't wait. Um, yeah, just go birding, I think, is the main thing. Uh, the more you can bird, the better. Perfect. So upload your eBird so you can start your life list. Yeah. And go get them. Yeah. That's so nice. Well, thank you so much, Gavin, for your time today. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. That's wonderful. If you do end up having any follow up questions, you can always uh, ask them underneath of the Facebook uh, group. We'll leave this recording there for, for folks to refer to. So you can mm -hmm. always put your questions there. And we'll... Type out the comments too if anyone has any questions. Perfect. That's fantastic. Great. Well, thanks everybody. And uh, thanks very much, Gavin. So hopefully we'll see you guys all one week from today and you'll get to meet. Paloma and Michael with uh, Flap and then the week after with Brian Keating and then we're off for the summer. So don't mm -hmm. miss those sessions. Uh, they were, they'll be great. And your session was fantastic, Gavin. We're really, really grateful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Stay, stay safe and we'll see you next time. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.